the karaoke there. Makes it easier with the tempo. Welcome to Calvary Bible Baptist Church, those of you that are with us and those of you that are watching. If you would, turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 13 this evening. Genesis chapter 13, verse 1. I'm titled this Bible study as we're going through the book of uh, Genesis is Decisions, Decisions. Genesis chapter 13, verse 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt, and he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he went on his uh, journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also went with Abram, uh, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was very great, was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take uh, the left, then I will go to the right. Or if thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. If you would, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for saving our souls from hell. Uh, Lord, I thank you for your word preserved and uh, uh, kept, Lord, for us perfect and preserved. Lord, I pray that you bless the uh, Bible study tonight. I pray that you bless uh, this church. I pray you bless, bless Calvary Bible Baptist Church. And I pray that, uh, Lord, you put your hand of uh, anointing upon the preaching and the teaching as well as the music. And we thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. So we see, we see here uh, in this passage of Scripture, as we're going through the book of Genesis, now uh, in chapter 12, we remember that Abram went into Egypt. Um, he went into Egypt, and he started doing the things he ought not to uh, be doing. Uh, if you will go to verse 1, Genesis 13, verse 1. And Abram went up out of Egypt. He and his wife and all that he had, and Lot went uh, with him into the south. I want to key in on the uh, two, uh, the three words. He came up out of Egypt. He came out of Egypt. Um, I'm going to say this. That's a good direction to be going. Right, amen. Uh, Egypt. If you know your Bible, and we talked about this in chapter 12, Egypt is a type, and always has been a type, and will be a type of the world. And uh, one thing about Christians is. Uh, uh, like we said the other week, uh, we looked in chapter 12 where Abram, uh, before he's called Abraham, he's Abram. He went into Egypt, and he was a type of a Christian that goes into the world, that goes into the ways of the world and, and forsakes the way of God and forsakes the Lord. And Egypt is a type of the world. When a Christian, and Abraham is a type, or Abram is a type of a Christian in this passage, goes into the world, they start to uh, be like the world. They start to act like the world, and they start to think like the world. And you remember uh, in Genesis chapter 12, when he goes into the world, what's he start doing? He starts lying. He starts to, uh, not only does he lie, he says that uh, Abram, or that Sarai was not only his half, or his sister, which really, she was his half-sister, but failed to neglect, or neglected to tell the people that she was his wife. And he starts to go into Egypt. And uh, I'm going to tell you, there's nothing in Egypt for us there, uh, except to pull people out of there. There's nothing in this world. This world has nothing for us, and it has nothing um, to do with us. Uh, the people of the world reject God, and, and God rejects the world. Now, God loves the world. That, uh, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But um, as it goes, this world... We're not to be like this world. We're not to act like this world. We're not to co um, acquiesce to this world and the ways of this world. And uh, in Je Genesis chapter 12, Abraham is a type of Christian that goes in the world. 
and his thinking starts getting messed up. When you go into this world, your thinking gets messed up. You start thinking like the world. You start, uh, you start going into sin. And I'm not talking about sins here and there. I'm talking about a life of perpetual sin. And uh, Abram, he goes in and he starts lying to people. He starts saying that Sarai is not his wife. You see, he never says that. He fails to mention that Sarai is not his wife. You ever hear the expression, to not speak is to speak? And withholding important information like that, uh, if I was married, if I had a wife, I wouldn't want to be um, nervous or, or lying uh, about, to other people about the relationship between my wife and I unless I had something that I was fearful for. When Abraham goes into the world, he starts getting a fear of man. And not only that, it passes on to his offspring and to his family, and, and Isaac starts repeating him. And the thing about it is you've got to be careful because people looking up to you uh, can see some of the sins, and, uh, and it perpetuates. And we went into that in, in um, Genesis chapter 12, how when he goes into the world, he starts breaking down. He starts breaking down morally, and his character starts breaking down. And we saw it. Here, Abram's coming out of the world. And um, I'm going to say, I have this note. Praise the Lord for prodigal sons. Praise the Lord for Christians that were in the world, that were in, uh, uh, being destroyed by the world, that come out of the world. Praise, praise the Lord that when they come back into the Lord. And, uh, and I'm not talking about Christians that are going back and forth and back and forth. I'm not talking about wayward Christians and double-minded Christians. I'm talking about Christians that they go into the world, the world stamps and kicks the the wind out of them and they come back amen praise the lord that they come back that they have enough wisdom and enough smarts and enough understanding to come back amen and um if you've been saved if you've been serving the lord for any length of time one thing you'll know and one thing you'll observe is a lot of christians falling away from the world um christians falling away from the world left and right as a matter of fact too many christians in my opinion uh, are falling away from the world more christians fall away to the world than we want. Amen? And uh, it is refreshing. It is a breath of uh, fresh air when one from there returns and stays and sticks. Amen? And uh, it's better to never have left, amen, and to, be to begin with, but at least if you have left, to return to the Lord. Um, because you can be a testament to others of what not to do. Amen? But nonetheless, it is, re it is refreshing to see some of God's children come back to the Lord from the world and, and, uh, and stick with the Lord and serve the Lord. So, here in Genesis chapter 13, verse 1, Abram is a type of, Christ of a Christian that was in the world, living for the world, living in this world, and now he's coming back to serve God. He's coming out of the world, and um, he's coming back out of Egypt. Mankind is, one thing about mankind is mankind is very fickle. Mankind uh, uh, will change one moment and then from one moment to the next. One moment we're doing something that we should be, the next moment we're doing what we shouldn't be doing. We're doing the opposite. And mankind is very fickle. Uh, we can't keep our mind on anything sometimes. And, and, and the more uh, further away we get from the Lord, the more fickle-minded people become. You ever been around somebody who they can't make up their mind about a thing? I don't know if I want this or that. I don't know if I want this or that, this or that. And it's very what? Frustrating. And you must wonder how frustrated God in glory gets with us, mankind. We're so fickle. We serve, especially Christians, we serve God one day and then we, uh, we live for the world and our flesh and the devil the next. And not even day by day, but moment by moment. One moment, you're, you're, you're ready to street preach, you're ready to hand out tracts. Next moment, you're in sin. You're lied, you're, you, you stole, you, you cheated. You say, what is that? Man is fickle-minded. Man is, is change, is given to change. You know, we're not to be given to change. We're not to meddle with those given to change, but yet we do. Same thing with serving the Lord. Uh, we're not, we ought not to be double-dipping one way and the other, one way and the other. If we will go to James chapter 3, verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing, my brethren... These things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh. 
You want to know something that Christians are doing is they play the Christian game. When they're around Christians and the brethren, they act one way. And then when they're in the world, they act like the world. You know, I call that double dipping. They're trying to be uh, 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 pleasing all people. And I'm going to tell you something. God says that ought not so to be. Does the same spring of water bring forth salt water and sweet, bitter water and sweet? No. Neither should you. Uh, the problem is, is that's how Christians become. And they lose their power with God. And they're not effective in this world. And they wonder why. They become what's, what, by, what the Bible, what Jesus would call lukewarm. And you wonder why he says that you're puke to me. He says, I work that thou were either cold or hot. If you're not living for the Lord, at least you're a good example of what not to be for those Christians that are coming up. But you're double dip and you're trying to be a Christian around the Christians and then a worldling around the world. And God has no use for that. He says, you're puke to me. I would spew thee out of my mouth because thou art lukewarm. That's a lukewarm Christian. Now, Abram gets, gets right here. He comes back from Egypt, praise God. But you got Christians that go into Egypt, back with God, into the world, back with God, and they don't know. And they have no power. And they wonder why their life is not a testimony for the Lord and why uh, things aren't happening for God in their life. They're double-minded. They're going back and forth. You need to stay on the road, not just go on the, and then get off. You need to stay on the road uh, for the will of God that God has for you. James chapter 1, verse 6. James chapter 1, verse 6. I must not have written this one down. Yes, I did. James chapter 1, verse 6 says this. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You know what? A lot of Christians today are double-minded. And they're unstable as water. And then they think that God's going to give them the petitions that they ask for. While they're living for the devil, living for the, they think they're living for the Lord. God says, you need to stop. You need to get on the road and stay on the road. Stop going into the world and then back from the world. In Genesis chapter 13, verse 1, And Abram went up out of Egypt. Praise the Lord. It's praise the Lord for Christians that uh, uh, come back from the world and uh, stay with God. And stay with God. And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife and all that he had, and lot with, uh, lot with him into the south. Now, Lot was with him while he went into the world. And people fail to realize that. When you uh, are living for the Lord and you got people uh, below you, maybe people that are uh, looking up to you, they watch and they live the way you live. And sometimes if you live for this world, they'll live for the world because, see, you do it. And you say, well, their heart's not perfectly right with God. Amen. But neither is yours. Abram is back and serving the Lord. He's out of the world. Abram, uh, I'm going to say this. Abram will never be able to recover the lost time he spent in Egypt. Abram will never be able to recover the lost time he spent in Egypt. And the same is with you, Christian. I'm going to tell you something. Praise the Lord for you coming back from this world. If you were out in the world and you got back, you got right with God, you repented of your ways, you repented of your sin, uh, you repented of the way you were going. But the world stole the time that you just spent with it, that you could have been serving God with. And uh, there's a lot of things this world takes. This world is only a taker. It's a taker, taker. It doesn't give anything. And the world takes. It takes your wealth. It takes your innocence, your purity. It takes your time. This world takes your time. Time that you should have been spending with God. Time that you should have been spending with the Almighty, your Savior. And you'll never get that back. Ever. And that would make a good message some preach someday about what the world takes from you. Because the world is going to take, take, take from you. It may look alluring, it may look pleasurable, but this world is out to, to take from you, Christian, and to, uh, uh, to draw upon you. Genesis chapter 13, verse 2. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. Uh, you know something? Is the Lord blessed Abraham with earthly riches. Uh, not everyone who serves the Lord will be poor, but not everybody that serves the Lord will be rich. Uh, but God will have both. 
Uh, there's people that are serving God that are saved that are poor people, and there's people that serve the Lord that are rich people, and there's uh, people that are common in between. And uh, the Lord doesn't call everybody to a poverty life, but the Lord doesn't say that everyone's going to be rich either. Um, people that preach prosperity preaching, it's uh, uh, false. And the same thing, people that try to make everybody poor, it's not biblical either. Uh, Abram, uh, the Lord blessed him with earthly riches. But actually what this verse tr really represents is the true riches of Israel. And uh, God puts a curse on people and nations to try to get rid of Israel's blessings. They were stolen by Egypt and then recovered. If you will go to Exodus chapter 3, verse 22. You know that place where Abram went? You know that place where Abram just sought out? Yeah, that place stole uh, from his people in the future. Exodus 3, 22. But every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And ye shall put them upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. The Egyptians stole the nation of Israel. Later on, after uh, um, Pharaoh, after Joseph is Pharaoh, years later there ariseth a, uh, uh, um, a Pharaoh who knew not Joseph or the nation of Israel. And you know what they do? They put the nation of Israel into bondage. You know what this world is? It puts you into bondage. It'll put you into bondage of sin, into bondage of uh, um, uh, cares of this world. And uh, they took and they stole the nation of Israel and put them under bondage for years of hard bondage and cruel bondage. You know what God did? He freed them from that and he gave them back the spoils of Egypt. There's a warning given by God to nations who try and spoil Israel. If you will go to Isaiah chapter 33 verse 1. Isaiah chapter 33 verse 1. Woe to thee that spoilest and that uh, thou wast not spoiled. And dealest treacherously, and they dealt not treacherously with thee. And when thou uh, shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. And when thou shalt make an end to deal treacherously, they shall deal treacherously with thee. You know, something is, we have no business, and the nations of this world have no business messing with Israel. Israel's got the plot of land that was given to them by God. Anything that you do against Israel, you're going against God and his nation. And look at what it says in that verse. It says that you spoilest and you deal treacherously, yet you weren't dealt treacherously against. You know what that's called? Unprovoked attack. You want to know Israel gets a lot of unprovoked attack. I'm not saying that there isn't casualty in warfare and innocent lives aren't uh, um, uh, lost to, due to the enemies of Israel. I'm telling you something is that nation belongs to Israel, and they're unprovokedly attacked by the world. And God says right here in this verse, Isaiah 33, 1, you spoil Israel, and you were never spoiled. You dealt treacherously with Israel, and you were never dealt treacherously. You know, there's people in this world, folks, that all they want to do is prey on other people. All they want to do is violate other people and attack other people while they themselves aren't being violated or attacked or defending themselves. They're called monsters. They're called wicked people. And the, there's people like that in the Middle East that want to see Israel destroyed. There's spiritual things going on there, but physically that's a nation. And they're attacking a nation whose boundaries are set. And yes, we know it's set by God. Jeremiah 30, 16, Therefore all, all they that devour thee shall be devoured. That's, folks, that's talking about the nations that go against Israel. And all thine adversaries, every one of them, shall go into captivity, and they that spoil thee shall be a spoil. And all they that prey upon thee will I give for a prey. Um, it doesn't pay to be a taker because God says you're going to be taken from. Actually, he says that from those that take, even that which they have shall be taken away. This warning is uh, the repeated anti-Semitic policies of the United Nations and the world today as the UN continuously uh, tries to shortchange Israel. But one day, the God uh, of, this, of Israel will come and scatter them and us. And I say us because we as a nation are part of that plot. And we are part of the world that's trying to uh, go against Israel. You say, well, why? It's God chosen nation. It was, meant, it was written down in the scriptures that God's chosen nation was going to 
listen, if you're God's people, you're not going to have anything but persecution. It's going to come. It's going to come, but woe be to that man by whom uh, they come. And God's going to squash the people that go against Israel. Look at Isaiah 33.3. Isaiah 33.3. At the noise of the tumult, the people fled, and the lifting up of thyself, the nations were scattered. God's going to come in, and he's going to ride on, on a white horse, and he comes down with the, with the armies behind him, and he's going to squash the, upright, the, the plots of this world, the United Nations, America, whatever, and all the kingdoms of this world that rise against Israel, that think that Israel doesn't uh, deserve what they have, God's going to come down and rectify them. One day, one day, notice as a man of God, if you would go to Genesis chapter 13, verse 3, verses 3 through 4, Abram's out of Egypt, praise the Lord, he's back with God, he's out of the world Verse 3, and he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Hai, unto the place of the altar uh, which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. Notice as a man of God, Abram frequents the house of God. Notice at the end of verse 3, uh, Bethel is the place where his tent had been at the beginning. And if you remember the Bible study we did earlier, Bethel... Uh, is the house of God, the house of God. Now, in the Old Testament, we know, doctrinally speaking, that the house of God was set up at Bethel unto the altar that he made the sacrifice unto God. And we know that the, uh, the uh, house of God in uh, the Old Testament was the temple. But in the New Testament, our bodies are the temple, but what we have similar to the uh, house of God would be our local congregations. And... Uh, the thing about Abram is he was a man of God. He, he frequented the house of God. <clears throat> Christian, you need to be in the house of God. Spiritually speaking, we call this the house of God. Uh, the thing about the local church is a local church is where you find refuge. It's where you find uh, uh, refuge from the world and the things of the world and the ways of the world. It's where uh, you, you have worship. It's where you hear from the word of God. And the Bible says so much more you should be meeting together as you see that day approaching. And we're seeing that day approaching more and more and more. And instead of having more and more people gather, more frequently we have less. Abram frequents the house of God. Now the house of God needs to have the God of the house in it. I'm telling you that, what, there's a lot of churches and a lot of houses of God where God's nowhere to be found. And uh, you know the Bible study, we, we brought that Bible study on Bethel. Bethel was the house of God where not only did Abram make sacrifices there unto the Lord, but Jacob went there. And then uh, sin happened and, and Jeroboam came in and made the uh, sacrifice, the oblation that was uh, of wickedness and caused that thing to be a curse. And God says later on, and he says, come to Bethel and transgress. And he taunts and he says, come, come to the house of God and transgress because the house of God didn't have the God of the house in it anymore. God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. God is almighty and he's all powerful. And he leads places where uh, uh, he's not welcome. And where sin abides. Even if it's called by his own name. I'm telling you in the last days a lot of so-called Christians and so-called Christian churches, God's nowhere to be found in their churches and God's nowhere to be found in their lives and in their testimony. And it's the truth. It's the truth. Genesis chapter 13, verses 5 through 6, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great. So they could not dwell together. God's going to separate Abram from his nephew because God's blessing was for Abram and his seed only. Uh, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, God calls Abram uh, from his kindred and from his family. And that included Lot. That included Lot. Now, Lot, we know, is a just man, uh, uh, the Bible says. But God's promises and God's uh, uh, workings and dealings with Abraham was to his seed only. And a lot of times... God's dealing with us on an individual basis at times, and we don't understand it, why God will separate us and separate us from people and, 
Uh, in the New Testament, Acts chapter 13, he said, Separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work whereunto I've uh, called them to. But God's going to separate uh, um, Abram from his uh, nephew. And you're going to find out later there's a reason why he separates him from his nephew. His nephew had some issues. Genesis chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between thy herdmen, uh, my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. I'm going to stop right there. That's not true. All right? They may be related, but they're not brethren. Abraham, Abram is going to be Abraham, and he's going to become Abraham, the house of the children of Israel. And Lot is not going to be. They are not brethren. Verse 9, Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan that it was well watered. Everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou cometh unto Zoar. So, so you get the idea of the situation of what's going on is uh, they're having strife between Lot's having strife with Abraham's uh, cattle and folks and Abraham's having strife with Lot and the land's not big enough for them both to dwell in. So Abraham says, look, this isn't going to work out. We're not going to be able to live uh, and dwell together in the same plane. So then he says, I'll, being a man of God and being uh, um, thinking of others, he says, I'll let you choose. I'll let you choose. If you go this way, I'll go that way. And if I, you choose that way, I'll go this way. And he gives Lot a choice as to where he wants to go with his, uh, um, with his cattle and with his uh, land, and, or land, with his um, belongings. Notice how Lot is going to choose based upon his own desire and what looks good to him. He doesn't choose based upon anything else of whether God was in it, whether God would approve of it, whether it was right for him to do. He's going to look, and it says in verse 10, And Lot lifted up his eyes, and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered, uh, where before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going to look at what pleases him and what pleases his eyes and what looks good to him, and he's going to make his choices based off that. I'm going to tell you something, Christian, is you're going to have choices that come down in your life. You're going to have choices where to work and what job you're going to have and maybe where to live and, and things that seem like normal everyday choices. This seemed like a normal everyday choice uh, for Lot, even though it was a big choice. You know, maybe who you're going to marry, uh, things like that. You're going to have choices that come down in your life, some small, some great. And every choice is important. And God's going to see whether you're going to, how you're going to choose. First of all, it's not even that you choose, it's how you choose. Because Lot's going to choose. But it's going to be based upon how he chooses that's going to determine the results of his life versus the results of Abraham's life and how their lives are going to go and how they're going to live for God and determine some of their character for God. Abraham let Lot choose first. Abraham let, uh, he's Abram right now, let Lot choose where he was going to live and dwell. Lot in this passage is a type of a carnal, fleshly Christian. If you would look in verse 11. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Remember, Lot chose, he lifted up his eyes and saw that the plains were all watered over by Zoar, where Sodom and Gomorrah were. And so he chose that. So he chose that. Lot made his decision based upon his eyes, but soon after would find out that the company is less desirable. If you will go to Genesis chapter 13, verse 13, I would like to draw your attention upon the numbers. 13 is not a very good number in the Bible. But nonetheless, if it's just coincidence, let's read the verse. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Genesis chapter 19, verses 4 through 5. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house. That's Lot's house. Round both old and young, and all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came unto thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. I'm going to tell you something. Just because something looks good to your eyes, just because something looks pleasing and it looks great for choice, doesn't mean it is a good choice. Don't be choosing based upon sight. Don't be choosing based upon your own 
uh, fleshly desires. Man looks on the outward with lust, while God looks on the heart. If you will go to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, nor on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. That's how Samuel was looking, because that's how we as human beings look. We look on people's outward, because that's how we have contact with. Well, they look, they seem nice. That's flesh. That's fleshly. You want to know what's really, how to really get out of somebody something? Is hear their speech, hear them talk. Amen. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. For out of the heart cometh evil thoughts, for, uh, adulteries, fornications. These things proceed out of the heart. For that which entereth into the man doth not defile man, but that which cometh out of the man. That defileth the man, because that which cometh out of the man is the real man. Now, we as human beings, we don't listen to people, we don't talk to people, we don't discern what's coming out of them. Instead, we just, ah, oh, they look nice, they look pretty. Well, because they're pretty, they must be right. Not knowing that a pretty face can hide an evil mind, as the song said, uh, outward beauty is very vain and very shallow when it comes to the real person, the hidden man. Man looks on the outward with lust. God looks on the heart. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on the countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. You know, you can find out a person's character by what comes out of their heart, by what comes out of their mouth, especially when they think nobody else knows or cares. Talk to a lot of people that seem like nice people, and then as you start to talk to them more and more and what is revealed out of them and out of their speech, you really find out something else. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. For all that is in the world. You say, what's out there in the world that I'm missing? I want to be part of. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. It's not of the Father, but of the world. And I'm going to tell you something. That Lot was choosing the plains that were well watered by Sodom, not because it was of God. And a lot of people, they feign God's will for their own will. Listen, if you're going to sin, if you're going to do wickedness and wrong, you do it if you think that you're just going to do it and no one's going to stop you, but don't blame God for it. A lot of Christians, they do what they want to do, and then they put God behind it and think, oh, it's of God because I know that everyone's going to accept me for it. But nonetheless, Lot, he's going to look, and he lifts up his eyes and sees what he wants out of the plains that he sees that are well watered, and he's going to choose it. You say, why is it such a big, why are you making such a big deal off this choice? Because this choice is going to alter his life. I'm going to tell you something, Christian, is you're going to make choices in your life that are going to alter things. You need to make the wise choices, but more, than, more important than making wise choices is you need to know how to make choices, and you don't know how to make choices without God. Nowhere in this scripture do you find Lot praying about it, or at least seeking God's counsel, or at least seeking Abraham's counsel, and the multitude of counselors are safety. You don't see any of that. He just lifts up his eyes. You know what it is? The lust of the eyes. For all that is in the world, lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes. How many times do we look at something and we grab it and take it from the lusts? In America, it's rampant. I mean, I'm not even talking sexual sins. I'm talking you go down the store and you just see something that you want so bad from your eyes catching it, you buy it. You know what that is? A fleshly reaction. That's a carnal reaction. Lust. What is lust? Longing? Now I want you to... The Bible says some things that are pretty straightforward on lust, but I, what I did was I defined lust from Webster's Dictionary, then I defined it from a modern dictionary. You know we live in a, a society of concupiscence, right? You know we live in a lustful society. Well... Generally, when you live in a society that backs up a certain sin, it tries to cover the sin. It tries to lessen it. And America is a lustful nation. So I'm going to give you the definition that they give. Or excuse me, I'll give you the definition that Webster gives back in a time when America was a better nation. Amen. Where America was more Christian. Amen. And this is what Webster says. Longing, desire, eagerness to possess or enjoy. Concupiscence. Carnal appetite, unlawful desire of carnal pleasure. It goes on. Evil propensity 
depraved affections and desires. Now, does that sound pretty evil? This is how they define it today. Very uh, lust. Very strong sexual desire. Having a strong sexual desire for someone. And that's it. I think Webster had it right. In 1828. Evil. Propensity. Depraved affections and desires. You want to know what America is filled with? Depraved affections and desires. Genesis chapter 13 verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, After that lot was separated unto him, Lift now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. Now, after Lot got what he wanted, it seemed like Abram probably didn't have the better looking of the two lands. You know, Lot got the more well watered. Got what Lot got what looked a little better. I'm going to tell you in life, it might seem like you're getting uh, uh, um, shortchanged in life by serving the Lord because you don't get all the fancy stuff that the person down the road gets, or you don't get all the goodies and trinkets. But God says, now that Lot's gone, he got what he wanted. Now the Lord shows him what I'm what he's going to get. Look at it again, and the Lord said unto Abram. After that, Lot was separated. Remember how Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the good things that he wanted to see? Look at what God has. After that, Lot was separated from him. He says, lift up now thine eyes and look from the place where thou art. Northward, southward, eastward, and westward. Notice after Lot gets what he wants, Abraham gets what God wants for him. You know something is... A lot of times God has for us, he has for us far greater things than the people of this world get. I'm going to show you that right now. Uh, you know what Lot got? He got a nation. He has a nation that still survived today. You know what else got? Uh, Lot, or Abraham got? Abraham got a nation. Abraham got a land. I'm going to emphasize those two things. God gave him that, and he still has that. Now, yes, they're fighting over the land today, but he's going to get it back. Lot loses both his land and his family. Genesis 13, 15. <clears throat> God says, For all the land which thou seest thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever, and I'll make thy seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed be also numbered. Arise and walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. God gave him a parcel of land, and God gave him a nation. Lot didn't get either land nor a nation. If you will go to Genesis 19, verse 30. You remember Lot? He's the one that got the prettier stuff. He's the one that got the greener stuff. He's the one that got uh, those stuff that... It looked like Abraham should have got. Well, guess what? He loses it. Genesis nineteen thirty. And Lot went up out of Zoar and dwelt in the mountain. You know the mountain, the cave, because Sodom and Gomorrah is in flames right now, because it's getting burned up because of their wickedness, because of their sin, and their smoke is going up and up. Look at where Lot's dwelling. He's dwelling in the mountains, folks. And his two daughters with him, for he feared to dwell in Zoar. And he dwelt in the cave, he and his two daughters. He wouldn't even go to Zoar. You say, why? Probably because they're doing the same sin that they were doing in Sodom and Gomorrah. And, God, and Lot sees that probably God's going to send fire on that city too. Lot's in quite a pickle. Lot doesn't have the land that he, that green lush land anymore. He lost it. You know what else? He also lost, he gets two nations, Ammon and Moab, from uh that were children, illegitimate children born unto him from incest between him and his daughters. That's what Lot gets. That's what happens when you choose in the flesh rather than choosing in the Lord. Choosing based off your eyes rather than choosing based off uh, uh, what God would have you to have. He has two nations of two illegitimate children that were born unto him from incest with his daughters. Uh, uh, Ammon and Moab, which become enemies to Israel. They become enemies to the nation of God. 
Christian, you better be careful how you choose and what you choose because it could have eternal consequences. It could have consequences uh, that impact your life. Oh, and also Lot loses his own wife as a pillar of salt because she rejects the Lord as she looks back uh, on Sodom and Gomorrah. He loses, he loses things that, you know what? It seems like Abraham lost out. It seemed like Abraham didn't get all the pretty stuff and all the good stuff. But in the long run, you know what God says about Abraham? I know Abraham, that he will command his children after me and bring up his children in the Lord, and he sets him up a nation, sets him up a kingdom. Uh, he looks for a builder uh, of a city whose builder and maker is God. But as for Lot, not too good. Say why? Because Lot chose based off of his flesh, based off his carnal desires, where Abraham chose based off what God would have him to have. It pays to serve God, stay by God, and live for God, Christian. It may not be so pretty all the time. It may not be so desirable. It may seem like they're having more fun out in the world, or maybe even the, the brethren that choose the other lifestyles or whatever. It seems like they're having more fun, and it seems arduous or whatnot to live the straight and narrow way that God would have us to, but you're going to make out in the long run. You're going to be blessed by God. Abraham was called the friend of God. Now, this is a couple maps of where some people believe Sodom and Gomorrah were, um, down towards the salt, south of the Salt Sea, of the Dead Sea. Now, Abram stayed out here in Mamre. You know something about this? There's another picture here. This was all well watered. If you go there today, this is all salt and stink and barren land. Just because something is pretty one day doesn't mean it'll stay that way forever. You know, uh, you look at a, especially if there's people here getting married and stuff, you'll only look on the outward appearance of a woman because you want to marry her because she's good looking. 10, 20, 30 years down the line, he or she is not going to have their beauty that they had anymore. And you're going to have to live with the rest. Amen. Amen. You make your decision only based on the outward appearance as very foolish, very foolish uh, um, decision for marriage, for anything. That person's good looking now and they have a rotten inward attitude. When that good beauty or that beauty's gone, now all you have to live with is that rotten attitude. You're not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You're, the Bible is very clear. You make your decisions based upon the truth of the word of God. Lot was making his decisions in the flesh. He was carnally minded. Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 8. For, that, uh, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay? Lot was in the flesh. Lot was in the flesh because he was making his decisions based off of what he saw and how he liked it. We can get that way, folks. Christians, we can get that way, and we have to be careful that we don't. We have to make sure that we have the mind of God, that we have the mind of Christ, and that we are making uh, decisions through the Spirit of God, not through our flesh. The Bible says that to be carnally minded is death. You know a lot of Christians are carnally minded. They only think carnally. They only think with their flesh, with their eyes, and they don't look on the inward. Uh, they don't uh, measure the Spirit. They don't try the Spirit. Lot was filled with lust. The lust brought forth destruction in his life, even though he was just. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. The Bible says that he was just, but he lived with some really wicked people that he did not have to live with, but he chose to. He was vexed. You know, vexed means to be, um, to be vexed, to be troubled, folks. 
You know, the Bible says that you're um, uh, not to keep company with fornicators. You're not to keep company with covetous and idolaters. And what's Lot doing? He's keeping company with them. If you're a Christian, you're trying to live for God, and you're living around that filth all the time, you would be vexed. And I'm not saying that we don't have contact with that in our lives, but, you know, we have a choice to make. Do we choose to uh, hang around those people, or do we choose not to? All right? I know we witness, and we try to bring in and draw in all people, but it doesn't mean that we hang around with them. It doesn't mean that we, uh, uh, the Bible says evil communications corrupt good manners. You want to know how you lo lose good manners? Hang around corrupt people. You know what Lot did? All because he wanted that piece of green ground. There's an old quote pastor would say, um, if the grass is greener on the other side, you can bet the water bill is a lot higher. And the water bill is a lot higher for Lot cost him his family it cost him his reputation it cost him his testimony and he lost when you make decisions and we'll, clo <coughs> we'll close with this when you make decisions in the flesh you will be vexed or troubled by them later J uh, James chapter 1 verse 15 then when lust hath conceived it bringeth forth sin and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, we know the state of our country is very wicked. It's very lascivious. And the reason why is because lust hath conceived in this nation and hath conceived sin. And now it's conceiving and bringing forth death. You know, that's the same thing that carnal mind brings forth. Carnal mind is death. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for all you've given to us. Lord, I pray that we make uh, good, wise, and right decisions, Lord, day by day. And uh, Lord, I pray that we would seek your word and your counsel. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.